Hello, Vanessa. A huge welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks. It feels <laughs> delightful to be here. I was going to say, say that exact word. It does feel delightful. It does feel I so delightful. Like I al almost how I always feel when I'm with you. <laughs> oh, it's absolute same. It feels so like just rich and beautiful and magical us being here having this conversation I I feel yeah and the the conversation we were just having about this conversation has um I always knew this was the conversation for you and I to have but it's just like ah oh, this is perfect for now so I can't wait so let's begin I would love to start with, as we were just talking about, the the coaching industry is like fairly new industry compared to many. Mm -hmm. And you've been a coach, you know, within the fact, you know, this coaching industry itself hasn't been around all that long. You've actually been a coach a pretty long time. You're someone who actually can speak with experience about the industry. What does it mean to be a coach? And so I would love to start there. Just I'm going to give quite an open question, but just would love your sense. And particularly if we kind of like cast our mind back to about a year ago, you know, just before you and I first spoke, what your experiences and perspective was on the coaching industry for you, like being a coach within that industry, what I guess perhaps like what were your hopes and dreams coming into it what you experienced during that time I'd love to know as a kind of starting point before we go any further yeah it's funny it was funny when you said that you've the coaching industry is quite young and you've been a coach for a long time it was this moment of like yeah yeah I have you know? yeah I so. yeah I forget that the coaching industry it was the 1980s I think was when the coaching industry was really born, don't fact check me, but um, about a year ago, well, no, let me back up. When I, when I came into coaching, I really fell into coaching. It was not, I didn't have this conscious awareness. I wanted to be a coach. I just wanted to learn about nutrition. And so I entered the coaching industry from that very, I'll give you an outline for the session. And this is what you talk about with your client. And it was very surface level mm. out of the gate. That didn't work for me. I was supposed to be talking about broccoli. We were talking about, you know, relationship <laughs> issues. And <laughs> I was out of my depth from the beginning. <laughs> I love that. It, it's like one way or the other. I'm, it's a bit of a uh, spoiler alert, but it's like, I love how like one way or another, like our soul is like tugging us all along. Like, hey, this isn't what you're meant to be talking about. This is your medicine. And then we're just like, la, 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 no, broccoli is what I'm here to talk about. Um, <laughs> if we'll get into that more in a moment, but I love those examples where it's just like, it, it, we don't actually need to look that hard for evidence of what we're really meant to be doing. Oh, that's so funny. I've never looked at that with that lens, but that's 100% accurate. Mm. But, you know, I have this, this, my soul is a rule breaker for sure. Mm -hmm. But then I had this conditioned, like really good student. So I'm like, I got to bring it back to broccoli. <laughs> Which really sort of became a metaphor for how I experienced the coaching industry. I, I just, I was filled with possibility. I think that's the thing that's so alluring. So mm -hmm. actually so pure and so wonderful about the coaching industry. I think mm -hmm. most people who enter into it have that <clears throat> almost like Alice in Wonderland before it gets creepy experience. Yes. Oh, I just had just chills. You took me back. It's a long time since I've really thought back to when I first came into the industry as well. And it was just like, oh, wow. You know, I mean, it, I didn't have it consciously like this because it was a number of years again until I actually really saw the truth of this, but it was like magic is real. Um, mm. But it, it wasn't a few years later until I was like, no, magic actually is real. But <laughs> there, there absolutely was like, wow, you know, this this world has told us these things aren't possible, but they are. Oh, yes. my goodness. There is something so pure and beautiful and needed 
Yes, I'm, I'm so glad you said that because I think it would have been dishonouring actually had we not spoken about the like the the truth, the real beauty that is yes. in, in in the coaching industry. Yes, and just would you mind backtracking to how many years ago was the broccoli phase? Forever know now. Timeline. <laughs> um, that was 2009. So, however, we're both mm. math. Whoever yeah. wants to do that for we'll us. Let the listener work. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Mm. So 2009. And it really was. I mean, I can, I can remember it just like, wow, I thought life was this and it's this. And, and immediately I was home. I mean, it was, and I, I, what actually later ended up becoming a very painful experience was I just knew I could see, it's like, I, it's like, I could see my destiny. And it was the, probably the first time in my life that that felt bright. Yes. I always knew that I was built for more here for something important, but prior to finding coaching, I was in this very grad school my worst interview of my life was for Deloitte. And, you know, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. And they were like, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and that was beautiful. It was actually after that failed Deloitte interview that I was like, okay, I better go a different direction. Cause that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And then I, can I just, I, I, yeah. what you just said there is again, another, <clears throat> such a resonant, um, Oh, I just felt so much as you were just saying what you were saying about this kind of sense of like, I'm here for more, I'm here for more. And then you found yourself in coaching. And this is the experience I had. And I know having spoken to many, many coaches, this is the same for them too. It's like, finally, I've spent my whole life searching for something. I knew that whatever I was doing for, you know, for me, I was a leader in a corporate. I knew that was, wasn't what I was put on the earth to do. Yeah. Searching, searching, searching finally stepped out into um I didn't necessarily call it this coaching industry initially but there was a point where it like absolutely was and there was a point where I'm like oh my goodness this this is what I was looking for yes at last there is a sense of again I'm not gonna I'm not gonna jump ahead too much but for a period it feels like we finally found what we've been looking for so yes. desperately for so long Yes, yes, exactly that, exactly that, and it's it is fun to talk about because I haven't connected to that for a long time. No, and it is me neither. Yes, mm. such a sweet innocence. Yes, and then the <laughs> <laughs> bad cop and just ruined it all. <laughs> we needed some like a soundtrack to this moment. <laughs> <laughs> and Hope then start snoring next to me in a second that'll like it'll just sound like rumbling <laughs> it's even funny in this conversation I have a lot of attention on coaching and industry next to each other because I think mm. that is what I started not yes. consciously it's really important it's really important that I emphasize not consciously stepped into the coaching industry and why I yes, emphasize that really well is because, seen. Mm. yeah what happened over the next 10 years I wouldn't say even 10 because I'm, I'm just over 10 now it was more like at around year five something broke that's the best I can describe it inside I was working with the best coaches literally I've only hired the top coaches in the industry and I did what they said and I learned how to make money and I was successful as a coach. I mean, and that in and of itself was, I didn't know how rare that was. I thought everybody mm. was, but something broke. And I just, I remember almost the session itself where I was again, sort of that good. I always showed up with some sense of not even urgency, but like, this is the most important place in my world every week. And I, I was always the one who had something to bring. And I could never understand how people could show up to a coaching conversation and not have something to work on. And I just every week was like, yeah, I don't know. I got nothing. I got nothing. I got nothing. And that was 
bewildering and heartbreaking because mm. I could feel that something was off. And then simultaneously, I had been on this sort of trajectory and I had this reflected back by a coach that once said to me, I don't know where you go. You're on the trajectory. Everybody knows who you are. You're about to be the star and then you disappear. And he was like, what's happening there? And I just, I, I started to feel like I was doing something wrong. That was the best description. I felt like I was doing something wrong and I couldn't figure out what it was. And I simultaneously felt a sense of imposter syndrome. I don't, that, that language has never quite resonated, but you know, to make it simple, that's what it was. And I think the most important piece is that I was starting to, I was, I was feeling really bored. I was starting to, for the first time ever actually question if I wanted to still be a coach. And that was a question I could never imagine asking. I even remember reading a Rich Litman email years before that was, if you're questioning, if you want to be a coach, you don't want to be a coach. <laughs> I was like, maybe I don't want to be a coach. And it just felt, um, at this point though, I think what's important to name is that I wasn't perceiving it as something wrong with the industry. I was perceiving it as something wrong with me. What am I missing? Why can't I pass this money plateau? And then I started, well, started just doubled down on the money thing. If I made more money as a coach, that would make me feel less of an imposter as a coach. And I just got really lost. Mm. But again, I didn't think it was, I didn't even realize that I was in an industry. No, this, I think this is such a important illumination because you're right. There, there is coaching and then there is what's become the industry around it, because I know um, there is such a thing as coaches who aren't in the coaching industry, believe it or not, I've hired one and you know, to a very large extent, he isn't part of that whole kind of um, group think that is, you know, saturated in the coaching. He really isn't. And you can tell. Mm. And it, that's rare, but it is possible. But most of the time uh, when we're talking about coaches, we are it's they're almost intrinsically linked with the coaching industry. And again, so innocently done, there is this sort of sense of, oh, this is what this is a direction to go in in order to be a great coach, a successful coach, an extraordinary coach. And yeah. it's completely understandable. And, and again, it's not even necessarily saying it's wrong. Right. I think there is just what I, the way I would say it, and I'd love to know your sense is like, there's something more, but even more importantly, there's something truer Yes. Yes. I think it's also really important to emphasize. I maybe had a minute where I kind of had like the torch and I was like, who's ready to burn it down with me? <laughs> <laughs> there was a minute. I'm not going to lie. A little rebellion, healthy rebellion. But I do, I do believe in the innocence of it all. Mm. It's grown yes. It's like a 23 year old or however many years or 43. Okay. Yeah, we can't, 40 we can't do the math, but yeah, it's <laughs> still quite young. <laughs> An immature 40 year old. <laughs> okay. Um, I do believe in the innocence. Like it's, it's something that has evolved quite quickly and it's powerful technology. Mm. It's so like a wizard who learns to use magic, but doesn't quite have the humility and it's misuse of power in a very innocent way. That's how I sort of experience the industry. And I mm. think it's fun to really learn the power that you have to create. And it's very human to come in to this power and want to use it for things that money and recognition. And so it, to me, it makes a lot of sense that this mm. occurred and left unspoken about, untended to, I think quite damaging. Mm. 
it was for me. There's um this links back to the conversation we were having just before we started recording about um inner children in short and this is the thing it's when when our inner child is running the show which honestly is the case for most modern humans when those inner children aren't being seen and spoken to and spoken of immature things out there are going to be something that of course are going to be attractive of course are going to harness all of the kind of fears and desires of someone who is ultimately being run by a child and so you've got this immaturity of the industry and the immaturity of all of us I don't mean like other people I mean all of us um that are then yes going to you know again so talking about children pure innocence yeah. And it creates things that we look back on and go, ah, oh, okay, you know, that there was there was immaturity there. I think there's also something um we may well get into more um later in this conversation, but you probably heard heard me talk about this before, how the way I see kind of what we we now term as coaches are really a kind of like quite diluted stereotype from the original archetypes of, you know, whether we want to call it the shaman, medicine man, medicine woman, these ancient, probably as old as human roles that we've had to have in the community. Mm. We had these people in the village because they were as essential as having the other people in the village. These aren't this, the coach, whilst the word coach and the kind of way we currently see it is a modern thing. The people who are meant to inhabit that role have always been around. Mm. There is no lack of maturity in that archetype or in the way that humans, when properly guided, have actually uh, embodied and expressed that role. And I think that's really important to recognize. Like this has ancient roots. We've just forgotten that it has. I totally agree with that. I And I, my guess is that it would speak to why your work in Waking the Wild is so, it's such a relief. It's so refreshing because I do believe that the people who come into this, who are meant to inhabit the archetypal roles, find coaching. And then I even remember feeling, and I think a lot of coaches go through this, that word doesn't quite fit. And I don't know why. Mm, yes. It's sort of yes. sentiment. I've, I've got exactly chills, like, yeah. I think it's yeah. very few of us that like have this sense of like, no, it's completely good. It completely describes what, who I am and what I do. I think yep. we all have this sense of like, it doesn't feel quite right. It feels limiting. And I don't know what else to say that doesn't sound pretentious or yeah. Yep. Mm. And then you don't know what to call yourself. Mm -hmm. Even now when people ask me what I do, that it's very social. I say, so I'm just noticing this right now. I'm a life coach. <laughs> I say it with this, like, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Take a shot. <laughs> yeah. And I'll, it's, it's really, it makes me laugh. A lot of people say, and, and you support yourself with <laughs> But it, it's almost, I, I bring that up because it's it's almost pointless in that moment, you know, just like the stranger on the street interaction to mm -hmm. be like, well, <laughs> let me try to explain to you what that means. But because that title is so limiting for so many, it just, it doesn't, the current expression of it does not connect to what it's, a, it is like a portal into these other archetypes. But I feel like at some point, if you grow up in the modern industry, you need someone to give you permission to say, hey, I know you came in through that door, but did you know there's 10 behind it? Mm, yes, absolutely. I feel like this is such a, again, a necessary conversation to be having that I don't feel is happening much at the moment. I'm not saying it's like not happening anywhere, but it really feels as though it's not happening much. And I think a lot of it, again, in innocence, it's not like, you know, whilst there is definitely some kind of emperor's new clothes stuff going on in the coaching industry, I think a lot of it just literally isn't being seen. Mm. It's just not visible. And when I saw it, I made myself wrong. I think that's, 
Because I, mm. I know people are feeling it, even if they're not seeing it. And I think at least yes. for me, that was really important. It feels important in this moment to, to really, mm. because I did two things. I first, I guess I, I was kind of gaslit myself. I guess it's me. I actually mm. had this painful coaching interaction not that long before I met you, where I just felt gaslit the whole time because it wasn't working. And I made my, I guess I'm uncoachable. And, and then I got really angry and I wanted to really kind of aggressively poke holes and make the industry wrong. But what we are talking about is this other place of just innocence that does feel really important. Mm. Yes. Mm. So let me know if you feel there's some important bits before we skip to this point. But I'm wondering if we were to kind of sum up where you were at that point when we first spoke a year ago, where would you say you were in relationship to this idea of being a coach and the industry? Where were you at that point? I was at a breaking point. I I think I knew there was no way that I could keep going the direction I was going. It was really a place of, I want to say despair, but that was maybe not conscious. It was more 100% just going through the motions. Mm. I didn't feel, I, I had started to actually look at it. I remember I asked myself, if I burned it all down, how would I rebuild it? But I kept having the same mantra that was, it would just be more of the same. I mm. kept trying to redesign, restructure, repackage, reprogram, rebrand, like all the things. And I just kept saying, it just feels like more of the same. And I remember mm. at the time, none of my mentors could understand what I meant. It was again, this kind of dishonoring of my experience. And it was a bit like, yeah, this is what it is. You just need to get in line with sort of the energy that I felt, but it was really painful because I dreaded every day. My work was boring me. Um, I liked, I still liked my sessions in the session, but it, everything else around it, it just was, it was such a slog mm. and it I felt feels, a bit helpless. Yeah. It feels to me so almost like sacrilegious knowing, knowing you now, as I do that sense of, you know, it's a slog and that energy you're, you're speaking of, it's just, you know, I know you to be like so much passion, so much life. It, it just feels like, gosh, you know, Vanessa of all people, to yeah, be where oh you God. were a year ago it's just like I know you were there but even now I'm like wow that's actually hard for me to think back to and it's quite painful actually it feels I really oh. remember uh, one of our early conversations you described this kind of you know like little seedling of you and it kind of represented the feminine and it being kind of like you know crushed underfoot and I think that's turned out to be one of those symbols that has has kept informing so much of kind of like what's happened since in the blossoming yeah. of you actually. Um, but it's, it's hard to think back to that crushed seedling and it's just yeah. like, Oh gosh, Vanessa of all I, people. I, I love that you said that because it's really full circle. The most painful aspect of that wasn't, well, I'll just say the most painful aspect of that was I was, I was acutely aware that the language was this could happen to other people, but not me. I was the coach <laughs> who was going somewhere, you know, like mm. because of who I was in my programs and how quickly and how fast I move. Yeah. It yes. was very much like, no, 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 no. I even remember saying that in one of our medicine circles, like, no, no, no. Like it was very much <laughs> that energy. This is not what I did. <laughs> I know. You know, as we know now, um, having kind of really done the work to distill, like, you know, 
that essence of who you are, you know, all this like brilliance and like crackling energy and just magic. It's like, how could that have been compressed and squished and contained in the way that it was a year ago? Like it, it is hard to be in relationship to that now knowing who you really are. So this, this feels like a, um, a good segue actually to, and I, I, I really know that there isn't a um, like rational answer to this, which is perfect actually. And so it might be that you're almost needing to uh, answer this question from kind of what you know now looking back rather than what you knew then. Okay. What, it, what do you think was, what, what do you think was happening that called you to the work that we've then been in together in terms of moving you from that place into all of the twists and turns and <laughs> deep dark descents of really understanding who you are what do you think was going on for you that called you there mm. When I got pregnant, I just before I got pregnant, I started working with a shaman. And there was a similar experience of the finding coaching when I found shamanic work. But I was very, so I worked with him for about two years. And that depth and actual magic blew me away. I mean, it was, it was like the Alice in Wonderland moment all over again, mm. which I was 100% is a weird language to use, but bought into, there was no part of me that had any conflict on any level with that work. And I felt a tremendous amount of conflict expressing that outwardly. Mm. So I knew that I was sort of dancing with the spiritual in my work. It wasn't like it was completely absent, but there was a real conflict with it. Mm. And so I, the, the sort of displacement feeling that I had been feeling in the coaching industry amplified even more at that point, because then I really saw nobody else in my world is talking about this. Mm. And so it felt really really uncomfortable to want to not know how to feeling a bit out of an, like not quite knowing exactly how much I could bring that into my work with my clients. Actually something really in interesting started to happen in my client work as well at that time, which is my clients started to leave working with me, not like, like, oh, we'd finish our partnership to go find someone more spiritual. And I was so angry. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean that in a cruel way, but that's just perfect. <laughs> Especially no, knowing know. you and that your connection to God is, how did I say it the other day? <laughs> Not exactly average. Not average. <laughs> oh, I was so angry. What do you, what? But of course they were. I was like harboring it. And funnily enough, you had been in my orbit for years, but I couldn't see you. I would see your name pop up on social media. Many, many times people had said to me, you should connect with Leanne. I'd go to your page and be like, no, <laughs> it's feminine <laughs> shit. I'm not interested in stuff, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, but something... I had, I had started a podcast called practical magic at that time. Cause I just knew there was something here. Like I knew there was people were doing it differently and it definitely felt better than the way that I was doing it. And yeah, I met Jonathan and then yeah, I'm just noticing I'm sort of off track of the question. Yeah. No, this was... is, I didn't know any of it. Like it's oh, not really? I didn't know it. There's something, it's not that I didn't know that I knew some of what you're saying, but this, I wasn't expecting you to go here in the answer to yeah. the question, but it actually feels not off topic at all. It feels beautiful because okay. it's so directly related to, um, yeah, magic, spirit, 
Yes. Um, which is the part that, you know, often is missing from the coaching industry. So yeah. it feels perfect to me. I wasn't expecting this answer, but carry on. Oh, okay, great. <clears throat> so it's simultaneously, I think what what's, it wasn't just about the work at that time either. There was some really deep personal life challenges that I was experiencing. So when I met you, it was in the context of bringing you on to the second season of my podcast. But <laughs> as history, we both we both don't know how that went. <laughs> a podcast you will not find anywhere. <laughs> Never happened. <laughs> And it just was this, I'll never forget the experience of meeting you because it was so magical and so unexpected. And I was sitting in one of the busiest places in Denver and just utterly sobbing, like unapologetically. <laughs> I was even meeting a friend who was sitting at the next table waiting for us to finish. And she was like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> and and it was so clear that this was the depth, it was the level of spirit, was the level of seeing. And to this day, I've never read the sales page for Waking the Wild Medicine, and I never will. I want to, I have the image in my mind of, but I, and I remember coming to the first circle, and uh, we had the email with instructions of what to get. <laughs> I remember being like, "Oh wait, whoa." This is re okay, Palo Santo. Can you buy that on Amazon? I did buy my first Palo <laughs> Santo on Amazon, which talk about sacrilegious <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> mm. But it was this real. Oh, okay. This is uh huh. This is different than I thought. Mm. So you even then, it was like my sense is your soul was had this sense like I mean, I am here for magic real magic I'm here for spirit this is this is the direction but there were still parts of you that actually didn't know what that meant that it, like no you really are though you really <laughs> really are <laughs> oh that's just perfect wow okay many mm. moments like that I feel like probably many more to come if if <laughs> It, it, there's something delightful for me in this in that I'm being almost like slightly it's not surprised exactly it's kind of like surprised and slightly like it's more delight delight surprise that you were surprised that that was the instructions because I feel as though and again obviously you didn't read the sales page there is that context but it's like I, I don't feel like we hide at all who we are in the work. <laughs> and it's, such, it's actually such a good metaphor because not on any level. I mean, I've been to parts of the like the archetypes and and now seeing your work in social media, there's almost this part. Was she always talking about that? Was she always? <laughs> it really, I think, is a beautiful metaphor for what my soul has been recognizing that my human self just mm. keeps not being able to see. Yes. And I think that's just the per that's the perfect expression of how that unfolded. Yes, I, I love that. I think it's just in that metaphor, there's so much. So, my dear, this this conversation has sped by and I'm I'm enjoying it so much. So I think we're gonna have to overrun a bit just to be able to get what we need to get in. So <sighs> <laughs> what have you discovered? Like what what is the difference this has made for you? And I'm talking about you personally. What have mm. you discovered? Again, going back to a year ago, you were, you know, really a bog standard coach, a successful one, a great one, someone that people could look to as an example of, you know, this is what it means to be a coach in our industry that we can say like they're doing all the right things, they're achieving all the right things. And then here we are a year later, having been on this deep exploration as to like what who you really are what you're mm. really meant to be doing in the world, how you're meant to be serving. What have you discovered? We would need a whole episode. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think the there's so many things. There's so many things. One of the most significant moments in the Waking the Wild medicine journey for me was 
I was praying at my altar, which in and of itself was significant because that did mm-hmm. not exist. I mean, the idea of Catholic church was, you know, what my experience of altar was. I don't think other than swearing or saying, oh my God, I had used the word God in 10 years. I didn't necessarily consciously know that I was, I'm not sure how to best describe my relationship with God at that point. I didn't have a conscious relationship one, but the unconscious relationship was insert 17 strings of swear words. Mm. Don't, don't talk to me kind of Mm. really, really disconnected. So one of the most significant moments that I think really, at least for me, I don't know if it's emblemizes or symbolizes, symbolizes waking the wild for me was I had done, I had done a lot of work. It's not like I wasn't going deep. It's not like I wasn't aware of healing and trauma. And like, I, I went deep and I had done so much healing work, but only to the depth of my family, only to the depth of humans in my life. And this moment, I realized that I had spent so much time trying to heal my relationship to my mother and to my family that it never, ever occurred to me that I had any beef with God. I don't know that I ever, I genuinely wonder if I ever would have gone to that depth without waking the wild. To me, that changed everything. It changed everything. I can talk about how that shows up specifically, but there was a period at the beginning of waking the wild where my altar felt like the only safe place on earth which was so significant because I don't know that I ever really consciously knew how unsafe I felt in the world. Like I could cry talking about it. Yeah. I, I, I just, there's so much in this, this, this is not the conversation I thought we'd be having most of this yeah, conversation yeah. through, but these parts in particular, it's like, you know, if, if I'd wanted this to be this kind of nice testimonial where it's like, and now I'm doing this in the world and I'm doing this in the world, um, you know, I know you could do that beautifully, but it really wouldn't be honoring of your journey and who you really are. Um, mm-hmm. And what you've just said is like, for me, like everything, it may not be to people listening. They may hear this and go, well, that's not what I'm looking for. And, and that's absolutely fine. Um, mm-hmm. But for me, this, there, there aren't even words to express how much it means to me to hear you saying what you're saying. It means as much or more for sure to be able to say them. Mm. I I really did not know. I really did not know how unsafe I felt on the planet. I was always looking for this feeling of home that I here I'll throw this in for your testimonial that I always <laughs> thought I'd find <laughs> in more money, in more success. And I would have completely completely rejected you. In fact, I did many times when you suggested that that's what I was doing. I, Mm. but for sure, that's what I was doing. So to find that home in that way, oh God, I mean, there, there, there really aren't words. It moves, it moves me to tears. Yeah. I want to, are you okay for us to go for like 10 more minutes? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because there's just so much more that we like way more than 10 minutes. But uh, (laughs) the one thing I'd love for you to share, if if you're willing to, is uh, Pepper and the Cracker story. Because I just think it's the most delightful (laughs) thing. (laughs) And if that doesn't kind of symbolize the changes that have gone down in your household, I don't know what is. (laughs) (laughs) So good. Yeah, it's so good. What's actually so beautiful too, because for so much of the year, I kept trying to, I would get up at 4 a.m. to, you know, be at my altar and like try to fit it in. And I still prefer that, but it also started to shift where Pepper would come and she'd want to take shiny things off my altar and play with them. And my poor eagle feather didn't really make it. 
but I, I started to build this relationship. You can, you can touch this, but not this, you can't take it away. Um, anyway, so we started to build the relation, her relationship to my altar, mostly around boundaries, but she started to get curious too. And so sometimes I'd invite her in, I'd say things like, do you want to talk to God? And she would say, no, I'm like, hmm, I wonder what be if you have. <laughs> And then we'd go for walks and she'd be with me and I'd come to my tree. So there were some practicalities that I couldn't keep it separate, but I had no idea how much she was really picking up. I really didn't. And so the other day I came into my altar, <laughs> there were seven really large crackers <laughs> set up in a really beautifully designed line. And I said, I said to Pepper, Oh, what is this? And she said, it's for the earth giants, which for those of you who haven't seen frozen Two 1700 times are the spirits <laughs> of the land in frozen Two, And it was so cool because oh. she, she found in the cupboard herself, the offering that spoke to her and put them for the earth giants on the altar, which just was, oh. Oh. and then she in the backyard and said to me, this is my tree. <laughs> Very distinctly oh. claimed one of the trees in the backyard. I think we might have to, with your permission, add a photo of that to the show notes because it is just, I'll just crop out the rest of the altar just so people can see the crackers because it was just yes. like, it's one of the best things I've seen in ages. Just so delightful, so delightful. Thank you for showing that. But I think there is so much in that that just says everything about your relationship to these things, how that's influenced just, you know, how you live in your family. I think just yeah. says so much, really beautiful. So really briefly and then I would love for you to talk about how it turns out your medicine is starting to make its way into the world but before I do that um we've almost made it sound as though uh the work that we've been in has been like you know there's just like you know sunshine and flowers and you know like well there's just sprinkles of magic um and you just very slightly dropped in kind of like the times where you really weren't happy with the things I was saying mm. and you know and I know <laughs> there were times in the last year that were probably the hardest times the like the hardest work you've been in there have been times where you and also you've seen other people in the circle really uh resent me Jonathan others in the circle the work itself it, it is the the hard is the hardest work I've ever done so it is I'd love you to just I think it, it it's important to honor this and this isn't really about waking up medicine this is true for all of us if we are mm -hmm. going to do this work of really understanding who we are and becoming it this is required one way or another this is required this is the initiation the initiation will take different forms but this is the initiation and I always want to honor that. So then mm -hmm. people are choosing into it. They do have some sense of what's going to be required, what it's going to cost. Yeah. And so I'd love to have just a bit of your sense of that, because I think it is important to honor that. I love that you brought that in explicitly. I, I really do because it is, it is like, a, I mean, in this particular container, a 10 month ayahuasca ceremony I've never even done it I feel like I don't have to <laughs> <laughs> I get it well, thank you <laughs> I have I have cried so hard that I've thrown up I have felt like I wanted to hit eject on the meat suit get me out of here I call it spiritual suicide where this where this where you're just like it's too much I can't do it not that I ever actually wanted to end my life but I wanted to make it stop Mm. I remember at one point I was, so it's such a beautiful moment in my relationship with you. I was, I was some, saying something along the lines of, okay, I'm really ready to see the truth of this particular thing, aspect of my life that I was journeying with. And then I was flooded by an unsurvivable feeling of grief, which I remember at the time thinking was really remarkable because I didn't think there was anything that felt unsurvivable to me because I was so gosh darn resilient. It was too much. Mm. 
And I think I said something at my altar, like that's like, that's too much. I, you need to ease it up. And then I came into you in the next circle and I said, all the magic is gone. I don't understand. I was in this magical flow and I was feeling really connected. And then very like casually, I mentioned this brief conversation I had with spirit and you said <laughs> so, so lovingly, no spirit is listening to you. It pulled it back. And I remember that moment being so important, but somewhat disappointing. Like in that moment, it felt like mm. really what it felt like was if so, so what you're saying then is if I want magic, then I have to suffer. Mm. And it's, I want to just say quite blankly, yeah, we could talk about suffering as optional and blah, 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 but it feels really painful and really scary. And like, it's never going to stop and you're never going to get through it. And it's not going to make a difference anyway. I mean, it is the depth of the worst possible experiences as a human that are required to journey into, to then be surprised and delighted by something that happens that feels like couldn't ever be solved is magically solved. But I have made unbelievable sacrifices this year in the most important places in my life, including work, including relationship that for sure are required for me to be the truth of who I am. And I really do not believe that I could have made without the work. Yeah. Cause it is worth it, isn't it? <laughs> Part two. It's hell, but it's worth it. <laughs> we do part two. <laughs> no, it's, I will say, let, let me add that in. <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been telling you and sort of joking lately that like the main structures in my life are collapsing as this person who was like making all this money and doing all this stuff. I've had recently experienced this really intense financial collapse and simultaneously have never been more certain about my wealth, have never been more tuned into my work, have never felt more invincible, happier. Uh, creative, efficient, productive in all the ways I thought I was supposed to be, spacious. I mean, there is no question I will have everything I want exactly as I want. No question. And that, that is a result of, but I also, for the record, am totally free to choose that, like, I could have it or not have it, but I will choose to have it where before it felt like if I didn't have it, then there's no mm. possible way I could be happy. There's no possible way I could feel fulfilled. And now it's like, I'm, I feel like a little tray of paint. Like I could become whatever I want. And that is just there. There is no, there's nothing you could. I mean, there's no, I guess what I want to say is there's no price too high to pay for that yeah oh gosh <laughs> I just felt that all over so my dear I think through the the kind of was like the symbol of emergence let's look at you know what, what you've discovered about your medicine and how it's right now and as you say you know hey you've got an incredible set of paints there <laughs> it's gonna look like all kinds of amazing things right now what's this emerging into yeah so i am offering something called emergence which is beautiful and came through in the most magical way what i realized what i learned about my medicine and this i think is such a beautiful symbol of of what waking the wild and this medicine work is one of the things that I had always uh, been reflected back is that I was too intense and that my work needed to meet people where they were, which ended up having me really dilute and water things down. But what I learned about my medicine is that it is intense and it's intense in many ways, but the, the most delightful way for me to serve my medicine is in a deep immersion. And so emergence is a four hour free, which is also radical, uh, <laughs> virtual, <laughs> virtual immersion where we really are diving deep 
playfully, another big part of my medicine, but very intentionally into the truth of who you are so that you can give yourself more permission to want what you want, the way you want it, to go about creating it by honoring the truth of who you are. And, um, understanding how much choice and agency that you have in that role and how much you don't. And I think it's a really beautiful blend of all those things. And the way that I, I love to create experiences. So this will not be a sit behind your zoom camera for four hours and learn type of thing. It's a really intentionally curated experience. Well, that's a blend of reflection, a little learning, a lot of dancing on or off camera. It's a, mm. it's a real magical blend of, for me, what I experience as the practical and the magical, the material and intangible in a sense of really safe community. Mm. Vanessa, is it spiritual? <laughs> <laughs> So I could have done one of my kind of very casual sips of tea as I asked you. <laughs> it is the most spiritual offering I have ever put out. That is so funny. Yes. Unapologetically, yes. Mm. It, it would have been... <laughs> Oh, that's dark. not what I expected you to ask. <laughs> if your answer had been no, we just had to like bin this whole episode. <laughs> what if I had like kind of tried to tweak the yeah. answer? You know? yeah. yeah, it's, oh my goodness, that's so funny. Mm. <laughs> I want to, I don't really have the, uh, a clear question formed but it feels there's something important here bringing us right back to the beginning what we're talking about about the coaching industry you kind of coming in as the broccoli coach (laughs) it's not that we haven't touched on it but it feels really important to me to just really illuminate like that that's who you were at the time And you had these like, as we often do, as I say, you know, these like little nudges from soul of like, no, no, this isn't who we are. This isn't who we are. We're we're meant to be talking about this. We're meant to be journeying here. Who who do you know yourself to be now, Vanessa? Mm. Oh, what a good question. Oh, and yeah, wow. Okay. Actually, the first, the first thing that popped into my mind was a messenger of God, emerging goddess in the real, the real sense. A home for shame. my inner child expressed and loved in progress. A shaman. Hmm. There's something else. Hmm. Something, something about love. Like there's something, one of the things that I often say is that I think at the most simple form, my medicine is that I will love the people in front of me until they start to love themselves. And that is the foundation I serve. And I am willing to go wherever necessary in service of 
truth. Mm. The truest truth. Yeah. What well, I felt everything you've said there. I, I've had so many chills during this whole conversation, like more so than a conversation I've had in a long time. Um, there's something so symbolic in that very last piece you said, which I think is really helpful to illuminate before we close, which is, as you know, in the work that we've been in, we have like ways of, I guess, distilling aspects. I mean, ultimately we can't, you know, hey, our soul is so vast, so just complex in the most intricately beautiful way. There's no way we can actually name it. And yet in the work we've been in, it's really important that we do do that work to do our best job of naming it. It's important. It's important that we kind of make these things conscious so we can kind of see them go, oh, yes, this is helpful for me to know. And as you know, so much of that work is recognizing the ways that we've had these, let's call them gifts, but like kind of use them against ourselves, use mm. them against the world. And as you said, that last part about kind of, you know, you're uh, uh, this is not exact word, but almost like you'll go to the ends of the earth in search of the truth. And as you're talking, I have like, I know you to be like one of the most loyal people. I had the like vision of, um, this is not maybe the most, um, <laughs> Oh God, I'm <laughs> so excited. <laughs> but I have one of a, a vision of, you know, one of those mountain dogs go rescuing someone. Like, you know, that that's the energy you bring. It's like, I'll do whatever it takes. Like that degree of loyalty, that degree of devotion, which is now, it, it's, it's been brought into the light. You've done that hard work of reclaiming the ways that that had been used. So this is just like, I'm going to, if I'm committed to something, it doesn't matter if it's the wrong thing. It doesn't matter if it's actually harming myself. I will mm. do it. Where it's become this like just incredible expression of love. Oh, thank you. I had this, I had this bracelet made that I'm wearing inside. It's inscribed at all costs. And at the time I inscribed it, I think it was more mm. the, no matter what I have to do, you know, kind of even if it harms myself. And now I, I, it was really funny. I just intuitively put it on right before we got on the call. And because it is that it's coming from that different place, like whatever is required to bring me closer to me, bring me closer to love, bring me closer to God. I will do. Yeah. <sighs> that I don't think we could have ended in a more magically perfect way. But I would like to ask you, for anyone listening who has, I mean, I don't think anyone could have heard this conversation, not felt you and your just purity and your love and your power. So I feel like that's a given. But for listeners who are really feeling that sense of like, ah, emergence, it feels like I'm, I'm called to this. How can they come join you for that? Uh, actually, the probably most delightful way would be to go to thepowergift.com. And there's a power is an acronym that I created through Awaking the Wild. That it's just a mini free training download that you can get there. And then that page will take you straight through to emergence as well. And I think it's going to be, I think the link is also in the show notes. Excellent. If you just want the to straight to emergence. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty good domain name as they go. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful Vanessa this has been um we, we sort of both we had the word delightful this has been way beyond delightful it's been delightful too but this has just been incredible thank you so much for, thank for you. being you honestly just being you thanks for helping uh unshackle me mm. I love you I'm so grateful to you yeah Love you so much. Mwah.